YouTube, it's Brian Phillips. Look at this BAE Hawk. So cool. I may have screwed up a little bit on our first maiden. Had the wrong size battery in there. This is a 3S 1300 that the sink calls for. It comes with a vector stabilizer, which does auto leveling as well, which is super nice, just like safe. And then we've got a regular battery alarm. And this is 1300 3S, just a little bit, just a little bit farther forward than you would have to start with, just to be on the safe side. It's got some nice hand launch points here. And you can see the CGs marked here. We're balanced so that it's nose heavy on, on these, or it's actually about perfect on this and nose heavy on that, pretty nose heavy on that. Okay, so this should give us a good crack at success. Now, as you know, it's got vector. So we have elevator up, elevator down, aileron up, aileron down, there's no rudder, okay? So we use the rudder channel on a four channel AR410 mm -hmm. to be able to control the auto leveling. So we'll show you exactly how we did that with some super simple mixing so that you can use a really cheap receiver to go inside of this plane and really hold your cost down. Or you can just use a six channel receiver and do it like we've done other planes. So without further ado, throttle cuts off. We're gonna go ahead and launch this. I'm gonna launch it the way they designed it, but I actually kind of launch, I usually launch planes like this in a different way like this. Now we also made one mix, just so you guys know, so that I can roll the plane when I'm controlling throttle because I'm right-handed, I wanna launch with my uh, dominant hand and then I can use my throttle control over here. Otherwise, you have to kick up the throttle with your mouth and then use your right hand. It's very awkward, I'm not doing that. And so you're in auto I'm, leveling? I'm in auto leveling, just swallowing my pride just so we can get it in the air good. This thing does a great job of auto leveling, so if your trim is not right, oh, and then also, we ran our ailerons to the inside <laughs> holes of the control horn, so you can see we got quite a bit of throw there. By default, it goes to the outside hole, so you have a lot less roll authority. So we'll see if we have a little oscillation as a result. Anyway, here goes nothing. Full throttle. Oh yeah, absolutely no problem. We're out of the safe already, or the auto leveling rather. Look at that. It's got good ups on 3S. Beautiful, guys. It's about 50% throttle. Let's try to slow it down for you for a really awesome pass. It is quite windy today, full disclosure, so you know what we're dealing with. I feel like I need a little teeny bit of trim on the elevator. The biggest thing is anytime you have a belly lander, folks, you don't get a lot of warm up. Like you're pretty much flying right away. And so what happened was there was a minor miscommunication between myself and the manual. And the manual suggested a 3S and we had a 2S. And so we ended up crashing it right on our maiden. It was really lame. And so we'll show you that at the very end if you guys are curious. Everybody always loves watching me screw up, so might as well go ahead and do that. We'll put the very end of the video, but look at this thing, still flies again, no problems. And that's smart. 3S 1300 is a great 1S, or excuse me, Gen 1 pack, meaning, as you know, when it's a Gen 1 pack, that will still have the balance lead, which is super handy when you're running these vector stabilizers. The vector stabilizers don't require an AS3X equipped receiver so you can save quite a bit of money so they're called a plug and fly but they're more of like a plug and fly plus if you ask me and we just started working with arrows so we're learning some of these tricks love the way this thing is flying you remember last night we flew it one time in the dark after we kind of figured out what we were doing wrong mm -hmm. it just it just does what it's supposed to do and guys it's windy right now let's fly over by the windsock so people can see now, I haven't done a bank and yank plane for a long time. Actually, that's not true. We did the X-Fly uh, T7A. Is that what that's it? Um, yeah. T7A, something like that. Look at that, guys. Yo, you see me getting kicked around. I was out of throttle, just gliding there. But that was the last bank and yank. The difference is that had a nose gear. 
which meant that there was technically an actual rudder channel for one thing. And it also meant that we had the weight associated with it, but we didn't have all the value and benefit from it. So what we did is we took a piece of plastic and we made it into a rudder so that it would function as an air rudder as well as a ground rudder. So on this plane, you'd have to just plop one in there and we'd have to add an extra channel. But I love the way this thing flies. Mm -hmm. Really good, really cool looking, awesome little yeah. plane. It's, uh, I wouldn't call it like a firecracker, but man, it looks good in the air. The turns are pretty well coordinated all by the dihedral or the polyhedral setup of the front and back wing. Well, the front wing has a super small amount of dihedral. It should be basically flat. And then if you look at that back wing, it's got the anhedral, which is really cool. So it points down. Just love flying this thing. Really cool. Upside down flight performance is okay. Nothing special to write home about there. It's a nice, nice fast flying EDF jet. 50 millimeter, if I didn't mention earlier. Gets into the power quick. Gets moving. Definitely feel a little bit of sag on those inside loops. We're about 52 seconds away from our five minute timer. We don't know what the timer should be, but this seems, seems to be pretty good on 1300, meaning we're gonna get a long flight time on it. I don't know if we're gonna get a whole lot more than five, but to be honest on a jet, an EDF jet, that's a pretty amazing flight time. And as you can see, She's doing just a great job. I'm surprised those ailerons weren't in that spot to begin with. I don't see any oscillation. Mm -hmm. Just love the way it looks. Yeah. It'll do relatively tight quarters, but you gotta remember you only have so much elevator. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. And there's our first landing right at the timer. So we're gonna check the voltages real quick. We'll go ahead and uh, just look on our little voltage alarm. We have the voltage alarm set to go off at 3.3 volts per cell. So basically what that does is if it drops below 3.3 on any of the cells, then you're gonna see that there is a, an alarm. Now the alarm will, it won't latch on. It'll just beep. Yeah, pretty, pretty wet. We were talking about wow. that inside debating. Just wanted to let you know, camera crew. Oh, you got your one right for the week, so. Okay, so let's check this thing. Oh, there it is. 3.7, 3.79, 11.2, 3.76. is about perfect, folks. So as you can see there, where we put the battery is about perfect. That gives you enough room to kind of stick this tip so that you can get that rotated around. Also, in the build, we ended up having to stack these two on top of each other. We glued those down just to kind of keep them out of the way. Um, if you don't, what happens is it prevents this thing from coming down. Also off camera last night while the camera crew was pulling some videos for me, I carved out this little chunk of foam just to kind of eliminate that concern at all. And it seems to have made it a little easier to get this canopy to drop on right like that. And it stays, it stays put. Now I'm not going to say that you would have to do any of those things. And then obviously this is where we broke our wing. So what happened was I hand launched. I launch it into the wind. I did pretty much everything right with the exception of being in safe or like auto leveling. What do they call that? Vector has another name for it, but auto leveling. I should have done that because it probably would have flown. It probably would have flown. But you gotta remember, I didn't have my rudder set up here yet. <laughs> so I had no control over the plane and I'm like, oh crap, and it started doing one of these rolls. And by the time I got my hands to the stick, it was too late and then the ailerons didn't have enough authority. So part of the big reason why you come to Brian Phillips RC is not just to see uh, really cool planes, that's part of it, but really we want to help you have a better experience with this. We don't want you to just go buy the thing and have a bad experience. We want you to buy it and have a good experience. So by the way, if you're going to buy this thing, look in the video description below. You'll see that we have links to purchase this and lots of other items. And we really appreciate you doing that. If you're going to buy it anyway, you'll help support the channel with a small financial commission that comes from the different vendors 
and distributors that we work with. The NX-8 has been very good for what we're doing here. It's a very simple application on this plane, so absolutely no trouble there. We set up three custom mixes, so stay tuned. We'll obviously show all of that at the end of the unbox build and radio setup is right toward the end of it. But this thing went together super, super quick. Beautiful mm -hmm. little scale lines, really fun little plane. Love these little planes like this. They just do everything you want and more. Now there are no landing gear on this thing. So just full disclosure, if you don't have a great place to land it, then you're gonna wanna think about that. If you have a geotextile fabric runway, which is generally out in a big grass field and the grass is well manicured around it, this thing will do geotextile, but I feel like you probably rip it up a little bit. There is a skid guard here and a skid guard here. Is that from the church? There's a bell going, that's so weird. Oh, okay, really early. so one, two, three, and then there's also this. So, sorry guys, we've never heard that bell. We've been living here for two years. It's so <laughs> weird. Um, okay, so as you can see, beautiful plane. Mm -hmm. Very. Just love the way it flies. Love the scale appearance for being a relatively simple plane. Build was super easy. You do have to glue this thing on. That takes about, I don't know, just a couple drips of uh, China glue and you'll be golden. And then up here, four screws lined up no problem. Give you one extra spare screw in there and then give them a shot of the EDF real quick while we're at it. Beautiful. That thing is beautiful. And uh, I love that the inlets are real and functional, mm -hmm. which is super cool. So both sides, of course. And then there is a quite a large cheater here. So when you are getting ready to hand launch this thing, you'll note that that will try to suck into your hand. So just be careful, get your hand up high enough. Now, the other thing is since we have a little bit of power left, I'm gonna go ahead and launch one more time. I'm gonna put it in, well, actually I'm gonna take it. I'll just leave it the way it is and I'll do it low in case I have a failed launch. Um, because having this little rudder control attached to the ailerons is like a lifesaver, okay? So full throttle, nose up. Some people will like that better because you can get to the sticks a little quicker. Just kind of depends on how you do it, what your preference is. That's the Eagle Killing Zone there. That's where we lost another bank and yank, an F-15 from E-Flight. That's how it got its name, by the way. Curious if I get this down right here. Oh yeah. See, it lands super, super easy. Mm -hmm. But even with, um, you know, and I'm not the most experienced pilot on YouTube, that's for sure. Um, but I feel like that auto leveling really does make it a lot less scary for launch. So turn that baby on. I also have an offsetting right here. So we'll go over exactly how to do that in the radio setup a little bit later in the video. But as usual, guys, thanks for watching. Brian Phillips RC. We've got tons of new content coming. I have a question. Yes. Because I know that people are going to ask. What? This is a small-ish plane. And uh. part of landing, the hardest part of jets kind of is landing. So with being a grass landing, where does this fall in the level of how difficult experience and stuff? Oh, this would be, I, yeah, I guess I didn't really talk about that. Well, I don't know. I think when I crash a plane on Maiden, it kind of makes me think, oh, it must be hard. But really I made some, I don't even think I made mistakes as much as I specifically didn't read the instructions. That was a mistake. But you know, like we all kind of do that as guys. So, but anyway, if, if you can get past that, I didn't really make mistakes. It should have, it should have flown. So on 3S, it would have been a challenge to get it going, but I don't think it would have failed quite as miserably where I hit the gutter and damaged the wing. So I would say this is somewhere on, you know, like uh, third or fourth plane. But honestly, in terms of EDFs, it's one of the easier EDFs you're gonna find that's, um, that's a good option. Now, that being said, if you have a great opened area that's wide open and you've got tall grass and things like this, you could get away with flying it um, as an earlier plane. Also, if you follow my recommendations to open up, uh, to go to the inside hole so you have more elevator or more aileron throw and then on the elevator on the inside hole too so you have more uh, elevator authority, just you might wanna think about going uh, a little bit higher on your expo. I was in 5%, of course, supposed to be there. And then this is the lowest, the most expo and the lowest rates. 
that actually would have made it fly better. It felt a little bit wonky on that last flight. I think I must have bumped it. Ordinarily, I start here and then I go here if it's too much. It needs more sensitivity to get to the ground or I end here if I need less sensitivity to get to the ground. But in my case, I just accidentally had it in the top setting. So that's one thing you'll learn too as you start flying these EDF jets and all sorts of planes is that when you have a, uh, an important setting, it's always good to get used to having all your sticks in the neutral position before you get ready to take off. That one's easy to miss because the difference between that and that is pretty minor. Now this one's a big one with throttle reverse on some of our new uh, generation of airplanes with the avian EFCs and whatnot. And the other day I caught this being, being pulled up, probably because my lanyard got it. Um, my lanyard must have got it. But I'm just trying to get in the habit of double checking that one because in the past I hadn't used G for anything. But now I'm going to G for thrust reverse. So anyway, yeah, in terms of easiness to fly, uh, it's really easy to fly. Landing is quite easy. If you put auto leveling on and you chop the throttle, it will basically glide itself in. You may have to flare at the end. The trouble is if you flare too much, then it'll topple over and you could damage the aircraft. But I can tell you this from our two crashes. The only reason it got damaged was because I ran into that gutter right there and it cut into the wing. And then secondarily, I think the first time it, it kind of did the same thing where I, I didn't have enough roll authority. So it kind of fell over here and it uh, broke that tail. So if you hit the main wings, I think you're strong enough at that velocity where you're going to be slow enough to stall that you could tumble with minimal damage. I don't want to say it's never going to get damaged because you could hit a rock or something in the ground. But I think for an, for an ordinary beginner pilot, this thing is definitely doable, but you'd have to be on the better side of, of beginner. So I wouldn't buy it as a first plane, but the auto leveling makes it really cool. And boy, this is not a toy product, guys. This is not a toy grade. This is a hobby grade product. It is a simple hobby grade product, but it is still a hobby grade in my opinion. We're using quality electronics. Everything is uh, standard servos. And uh, well, I mean, they're still micro. They're not, you know, like 30, 30 gram servos. But the thing is they are uh, what I would consider to be standard, even though standard to me is micro. Um, so they're like nine gram servos, plastic gear. Everything is high quality. The receiver's high quality. Uh, excuse me, in this case, it's not even a receiver, it's just a flight controller. But that uh, Vector flight controller has been great. So we've only done two of them so far, and we think that it's going to be a really good solution for people that don't want to drop 100 bucks on a receiver or 90 bucks on a good receiver. And you can still, you know, buy a, a simple air receiver that's four channels and spend a lot less money, still get Spectrum gear, um, and basically go ahead and get that reliability, and you can fly. Um, because what's happening is the knockoff brands are getting more expensive and so is Spectrum, but Spectrum's increase has been lower, so the gap is getting smaller every day. Plus with forward programming coming along, which you don't even need to use forward programming for this plane, I used mixing to do the things I needed to do. Because we don't have AS3X and safe, um, that's all handled by the vector, you don't even need that. So like you could plop a Futaba receiver in there, you could plop, um, you know, like some FR Sky solution, or you could do an open TX, um, you know, variety, whatever it happens to be at that case. And really all you need is the four channels. You need an elevator, aileron, throttle, and then there's on, off, uh, stabilizer on, stabilizer off, um, auto leveling on. So that's four channels. There's, there's nothing more needed. Uh, the one main complication you run into on an air receiver is that you have to mix out rudder. And in our case, we mixed rudder to aileron. Mm -hmm. And then we also needed to mix a switch condition to rudder. So it's a little bit unusual on how to do that. And I show you how to do it. Uh, it's a little bit of back and forth, but it's probably, a, I don't know, like a 10 minute radio setup. It's not mm -hmm. even that long. So guys, watch. Uh, do yourself a favor, learn something new if you haven't already done that before. It's a really handy tool. And plus, those tools can be done in a simpler radio, actually. But the Expo dual rates and things like that are really nice on a computerized transmitter. We've been super happy with the NX-8. Uh, definitely wouldn't need the 8 for a plane like this. You could get away with the 6 for sure, or even one of the DX, uh, the older DX. But I'm not encouraging anybody to get a DX right now. Um, the reason being is, I mean, unless you're getting ready to fly with a DXS and then it's just whatever it comes with. Um, if you get a DX, anything, you're eventually going to lose support. So 
don't do that. Just get the NX or IX if you really want to blow a lot of money. Um, the reason I'm telling you that is because that's what I'm learning. <laughs> I can't go into more detail for a lot of reasons. But anyway, if you get a DX and in like eight months, the firmware doesn't get updated and you aren't able to do some feature, I'm gonna feel bad saying, that's what I warned you about. So I am letting you know that now in not so many words. Anyway, that plane's awesome. I think you should buy one. It's not a super expensive plane. Really fun possible gift idea for Christmas. If it is a gift idea, order it yesterday. Order the receiver. Don't forget the stuff. You need the stuff, okay? Get the receiver, get the plane. We'll link to both of them uh, so that you can buy them from Hobby Zone. Uh, if you want to buy them there, of course, we get the links there. And uh, of course, if you want to buy these things, we'll have links there and then a link to the battery as well. And uh, as always, we really appreciate you guys. Best audience on YouTube. Stay tuned for the Unbox Build and Radio Setup, and we will plop the crash and the subsequent uh, decisions on how to repair things at the end. Thanks for watching. YouTube, what do we have here? You've already seen it fly, but we haven't. This is a BAE Hawk, which is an Arrows product. We started working with Arrows. We just did this plane, the 540 Edge. Super, super impressed with it. I managed to break it on my fourth flight because I hit the prop on the ground. Replaced the prop. Beautiful. Look at this, guys. I dipped the tip again. Sheesh. No wonder I broke the wood prop. Yeah. So, oh yeah. So anyway, this plane is a no wheels up, no wheels down sort of thing. <laughs> oh, there's a bunch of receivers in here. Fancy dance. Okay, so AR620 receiver. And it looks like they put a 1300 milliamp 30C Venom pack. Yeah, baby. Venom has been a good alternative. If you're into the smart tech, these things are a little bit more economical. We've had real good luck with Venom. So let's go ahead and just slide that over there. And let's check this out. Okay, so the, Bay, the Bayhawk or is it the BAE? BAE, I think. Okay, so this has the vector, which is kind of cool. So that's like a stabilizer. So instead of having to buy a more expensive receiver, which by the way, you can do this still if you want. AR 630 would be perfect for this if you don't have the vector, but with the vector, all you need is just a plain Jane. Six channel receiver is nice. There's also a four channel receiver, but just remember, if you're, ooh, we might, we'll, we'll see. Sometimes you can do it with a four channel receiver too, but the vector has to be turned on and off. If you wanna be able to switch between auto leveling and stabilization and then no stabilization. So the three different modes of action. Ooh, nice packaging, real simple. This is a 50 millimeter EDF jet. Like I said, no gear, this is a belly lander. So you pretty much hand launch, belly land in the grass or some sort of a surface that's smooth. You can land it on geotextile fabric, but on our runway, we've got concrete, so you probably wouldn't wanna do that. You'd scratch the crap out of it. Beautiful, Banyol's not folded, love that. Uh, looks like the vector instructions, real simple. Ooh, fancy. Here's our wing size. This one is um, 661.5 millimeters. That's pretty specific. Look how small it is. That's I sweet. Know. I'm oh, excited wow. to see this. It's almost like UMX style. And then they've got this little place for you to hold onto the plane and you can throw it like that too. It's, it's weird, this wing, it's hanging back like that because the weight's in the back. Love the red. So FMS analog. This is an analog nine gram servo. Can't tell if it's metal, guys. I just can't get the angle. You can see, if you want to look it up, you can see it right there. Plastic, plastic. It's probably plastic, but that's fine. We need a light, we need a lighter plane. So uh, some of these planes, you get too many Metal Gear servos and you will make them really heavy. So I love the anhedral on the tail of this plane. Um, that is so cool. It's so small. I know. So these are pinch hinge construction, which on a plane this size, not really surprising. Obviously no inboard flaps. You could set up flap runs. Don't think you're gonna really need it on this plane. 
Uh, with EDF jets, many times what you wanna do is try to get the CG back as far as you can and still get stable flight performance. And then you can come in and flare it. Oh, that looks so sweet. Look at that. That is so nice. Love the lines on this. So cool. And then the tip is reinforced with plastic, but not very much, only a little bit. They do have a scratch guard here. And then two control rods and you can see the EDF. Look at the fan blade. That looks so sweet. I bet it's gonna sound great. For a 50 millimeter EDF, I'm quite excited to see how that goes. So it should be a really easy assembly. That's, that's all the parts, guys. Yeah, that's everything. So cool. There's gotta be some hardware in there somewhere, right? Is there? Are you sure? Yeah. Why would you need hardware? How do you attach the wings to the fuse? Um, you know what? There's screw holes in the fuse. Oh, look at that. See, the camera crew is always right. Mm -hmm. See this? Even got it on video. There's a total of one, two, three, four, five screws. Crazy. That thing was disappeared in this stuff, so be watching for that. Good catch, camera crew. Okay, so we'll put this off to the side. That is totally emptied. Really nice. Oh, I'm looking forward to this. It's gonna be so simple. Now, also, we are gonna be setting this up on the NX8, which has been our go-to radio for a while. We used NX6 before this, then before that NX8, or excuse me, uh, DX18. Very happy with those in terms of performance. We incidentally put a 620 in this edge, worked out really good with the vector system. So we'll be able to evaluate that a little bit. And just if you guys have questions, let us know in the comments below. I doubt you will, because we're gonna go over it all. So now Venom Packs, we use Venom Packs for that plane right there. The and Boeing? they were really nice for the longitude, the UMX. Oh, really? Cessna longitude, point down cool. so they can see which one you're talking about. The Cessna longitude, UMX, there you go. And the other thing that's kind of cool about this particular battery, if you want to look over here, we'll get these charging. So this is 1300, 2S, whoa, 30C. Good thing they sent the battery, right? And then this comes with adapter ends, which is not customary for every Venom pack, but I think a lot of them do. So you've got a Dean's adapter, you've got of course an XT60, and then you've got EC3 or IC3 emulation. So that's really good. So looks like this channel is done charging. So we'll go ahead and unplug this smart pack. This is a 1300 3S. We were just getting a bunch of batteries ready because we didn't know what we were gonna need for this plane. And uh, I overestimated the size. I didn't know like how big this thing was gonna be. Looks like I can't tell if this is tape or not, but we've been real happy with our Venom packs. All right, so balance lead here, plug that in, brings up the data right away. And then in this case, we can use this adapter, which is provided. And that goes right in. Then all we have to do is, because this isn't a smart pack, we do have to set the, we have to set the current and it will have to set that each time, which that's 1300 milliamps. So, whoa, it's already 1300. That's pretty cool. That's just pure luck though. You know why? Because we happen to be doing a 1300 before. If that would have been a 5,000 milliamp hour, it would have charged at 5,000, or you would have had to change the setting. Not a big deal, it's not hard to do that. You just gotta remember to do it. Um, so we'll keep that adapter for a little later. And then probably on this, we'll use a voltage alarm just so we can get an alarm at low voltage and then kind of use that as a telltale sign to help us make our assumptions for how long it's gonna take. We'll go ahead and just get this receiver out too. Antennaless receivers, they're not actually antennaless, but what happens is they, they put an extra trace in this part of the board up here. And I don't know if you can see it right there, kind of behind that tag. That top portion of the board has a trace that goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it's an internal antenna. And of course, six channels. And if you're looking close at these, you can see how it says S plus and minus. So signal plus and minus. So brown, red, and uh, orange. Or Futaba would be black, red, and white. Okay. And then a bind button. That battery is actually uh, where you could provide power. Or you can provide, you know, I. I think that you can put a bind plug there. It's just strange it says bat. I don't know why it says bat. Uh, and so then just some packaging and things like that. This does come with 
some different safety instructions and all that jazz. So that's pretty good stuff. So we'll just go ahead and file that away permanently and uh, we'll get the stuff out of the way. So guys, this build should be pretty simple. Typically on a build like this, you figure on working for, I would say about 20 minutes. And uh, we take a little bit longer because we go into detail explaining things. But let's literally just dig in because this is such a simple build. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> if you want to look right here, that's the vector system. So that's the flight controller. Wow. Those controls and wires are really close to each other. I'm going to need to make sure those work. And it looks like we have an XT60 on here. So that's good. That'll work with our smart batteries or with the battery that was provided here. A little piece of Velcro there that's in included and a strap. It's the mid grade strap. And then the vector receiver or the vector um, flight controller. Yeah, so just like the same. So we have one, two, three, four. Ooh, you know what's kind of tempting about that? Hmm. You know what's tempting about that, Megan? Use a four channel receiver. Booyah. What's Look that at that. It's a four channel sport receiver, the AR410. We never have an opportunity to show this. But if you truly only need four channels because you're using only four channels, then you can do this. But wait, we have one, two, three, four. That's it. We only need four. But wait, does that give you Yes. to turn the vector on and off? Yeah, because this is a bank and yank, isn't it? It's got an elevator. There's no rudder. So yes. So elevator, aileron. So we don't even need the six channel. We can go straight for the four channel. So that'll save you guys even more bucks in the RC bank account. So we're going to use the four channel instead of the six. So this is exactly the same scenario. The antenna's up top. This just has a little bit different spot for the button. And the antenna's under there. If you were to tear it apart, you'd be able to see that. So we have the bat and then channels one through four. Okay, cool. Well, I'll take it. It's a victory for us today. Um, now, if that doesn't turn out, we'll just go back. We'll just divert back to the uh, six, but there's no reason why it wouldn't work that I can tell. So the other thing too, is if you don't trust this uh, flight controller, you'd rather not have a flight controller, which on a small plane like this, you're gonna want a flight controller. Uh, stabilization of some sort will really make it fly a lot better. Let's go ahead and build this thing. This is gonna be super easy. Sure. We got four screws plus a spare, it looks like. What, what are they? They're all the same. Phillips. Oh, do we have to glue this? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure Cause out. Cause it looks like there's no screw holes on this back one. I might have to read the directions. Oh, is that why they give you? I think so. Is that what this is? Okay, so. Yeah. Yeah, we have to glue. So they're wanting foam safe CA. We're gonna use mucilage or foam tack this time. Okay. China glue. China yeah. glue is the way to go on this type of joint, in my opinion. Now you can do whatever you want with your plane. CA is fine. CA is really easy to work with. This is just as easy. This is called foam to foam. It is like China glue. Mucilage is really good too, but mucilage is like a Hobby King product. I would recommend this. This is what we get from uh, Horizon. So this tube has lasted forever. Okay, so you're gonna slather that where you need it and you're gonna slather it where you need it over here too. So it's a contact cement basically. And I don't know if you guys can see, I mean, it's not like you have to be ultra specific where you get it. Okay. And then this aluminized tube, when you squeeze it, it'll stay squished. So it kind of like comes out when you're done, even though you, you kind of want to stop the flow, it keeps coming out. Mm -hmm. So you got to be a little bit careful about that. And then we use Q-tips. Q-tips work really good for spreading this stuff around. So I'm just going to take and just kind of cover the surface up. This also will help to activate that stuff. Now you got to work fairly quick because the way this construction is going to go together, you want to get it so that it's spread out a little bit on the front there on that little spot there, just a little bit. We don't want to go too crazy. And then same thing on this. We'll just spread that out. This stuff will cook off for a minute and then it'll get extremely tacky. Okay. And when I say tacky, I mean, so tacky that you won't be able to slip it. If you, if you put the stuff on there and you don't get it attached quick enough, you won't be able to slide it in place. And so there is a solution. 
There's two remedial actions. One, you can put kicker on there and wipe it off and it will clean down to bare foam. Or you can put some more of it on there and just work it and the solvent will sort of break down the other layer, but it gets thick, so be careful. Meaning it gets, like you just get so many layers, you can only do that about twice. Mm -hmm. Then you're gonna have to do the, the other method. Now normally you would push and pull apart the two components, but I'm literally gonna put it on there. Got a little bit on the finger. If you get some on your hands, it's really easy to take off with just a clean rag, or you can use the same thing, a little bit of kicker on a rag and you can wipe it off. Even if it's dry, it'll break it down. Okay, so now let's look at how tight that is. My goodness, that was That's... really, really easy. Holy cow. That, you never get components to glue together that good. So now the other thing you can do is if you're wanting to fly it in five minutes, like what we're gonna do, you, you can actually pin that with like uh, a toothpick, but I honestly don't think it's gonna be a problem because by the time we get, well. No, don't put no, holes in it. You don't wanna pin it? Okay, we'll not pin it. You talk enough, it'll be more than five minutes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the screws, see how this works. <laughs> um, also, the other thing too to keep in mind is that if you wanna do flap rounds on this plane, um, the vector's not gonna really support that that I know of. There might be a way to do it, I don't know about it yet because it's still new for us. If you went to an AR620, you could do the flap rounds, but then you're gonna lose your stabilization. So what you would do is you would take one of the two channels, you would assign it to the other aileron, and then you would have no stabilization or auto leveling through this channel. But because it's redundant, you could still provide for flapperons, okay? I don't like that solution though. If you're gonna go all out and do flapperons, then you wanna step up to something like a 630, which is gonna allow you to do flapperons. Then you're gonna program from scratch, just like we've done a number of different times. And, um, but in this case, I think we're gonna be just fine with what we've got. So actually we're gonna take just a quick second, get the plane stand out and come right back. Okay, so we've got the plane on the plane stand. We just have to feed these two wires through and then put this little bump through up here in this hole. Should be pretty straightforward, but I can't quite tell where the wires come out. I think they're supposed to go through the little hole according to the directions. Oh, it goes this way. It's not a big deal. They should go pretty much all the way down. Okay, then we're just gonna drop this down. You don't wanna pinch the cables. Um, cause if you pinch the cables, it'll make it really hard for them to pull through. So kind of leave the plane, leave the wing down like that and then pull the wires up and you can use that to kind of pull your wing in. Okay. So while I've got this, you know what? Let me take that out of your way. Where's the Y cable? How does this work exactly? There's gotta be a Y cable in here somewhere. That's throttle. Oh, there it is. Okay, found it. Let's just undo this. Undo this. Okay, cool. Untangle this. And then we're gonna also kill two birds with one stone by doing this, because we're gonna get that all straightened out. Okay, these are ailerons, and it's a shared channel, so it doesn't matter which one goes where. Now, how do you know those are ailerons, Brian? I don't, I'm just assuming, because it's where the Y cable's plugged in. And there's no retracts on this plane or flaps, so it's gotta be just this. If somebody at the factory got it wrong, then it'll be wrong, okay? You see what I'm talking about down there? You wanna keep this free so it can move. Mm. You don't want it to interfere with the cables at all. And this throttle cable's kinda got me out of sorts here. I'm gonna unplug that, put it through and under, and then back, is that the same direction it was? Okay then I don't know what this extra cable's for, but we had that on the other plane and I still didn't know what it was. Oh. Yeah, I think I'm gonna try to stuff all this back. Let's use forceps for that. Forceps are a nice tool to have. If you're gonna find yourself building a lot of planes, you might as well get yourself a nice pair of forceps. Forceps, the bent tip, the bent tip is the way to go. You'll think it's like, why would I need a bent tip? Well, you'll find out. It's like always works that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so grabbing the lead very gently, stuffing it back in here, okay, then let go. Same thing, grabbing the lead. Remember, you don't wanna clamp on there and short out those cables. You could easily cut that cable with these forceps. Okay, hey, that's good enough for me. I like it. Okay. I think it's gonna work. It's not perfect, okay? It's not perfect, but it's fine. Then these two, hmm, I don't know. Should we just glue them down? 
How does this look? That's oh yeah, we got good. lots of room. I feel like, let's just glue it. Yeah. We'll just glue them down. That should be no problem then. The receiver, well hold on actually, before we get too excited, where's the receiver gonna go there, camera crew? Oh, well, you know what? It almost looks like they kind of have a little tray spot down in there. Oh yeah, go? well it depends on where the battery needs to go. Seems like every single tray that we have is always in the wrong spot. That would be a pretty fancy place for the receiver up there if we could can do it that. Can slide under? Yes, yes, on this plane it can, yes it can. But that also undermines our ability to put the battery back there if we need to. Mm -hmm. So if I can fit my transmitter, or my receiver rather, up here, now this can be just fit anywhere. It doesn't need to be in a specific spot because this is not a stabilized receiver. It can just be plopped wherever it fits, okay? It's not like it has to be on the center of gravity or anything like that. Because this thing is what's doing the spatial awareness for us. Okay, so this needs to go. I'd really like it to be right here if it'll fit, if I can get it to go. Yeah, not quite enough width. Well, in that case, I am gonna glue these down. That'll be super easy. Get them out of our hair. Okay. You could Velcro them down too, if you wanted to. I'm just gonna go a little teeny bit of tack up there. And this time, remember, it's not like we're gluing a wing on. We just wanna hold those two wires in place. So we're, we're not even gonna mess with it. We're just gonna let that set for a minute or two while we put the, uh, while we put the screws in, okay? Since it's in pin, I feel like we should plug it in and put it under that foam tray. You know, can. I like that concept too. I like that concept and we'll probably end up doing that because end pin, end pins, meaning that the pins are out the end instead of top pin pointing up to the top. But let's go ahead and throw these screws in while that glue is setting up. Okay. Because that glue needs to cook off for a few minutes. So there's four screws, obviously. Good big plastic uh, receivers here to take the screw and spread that load out into the wing. So I'm just dropping these in one at a time. Now, what I usually do on, on wings like this is I will start the screws, biting immediately, no problems. Biting immediately, no problems. Biting immediately, no problems. But I want this to drop down like that. There we go. So usually I'm gonna look for puckers in the foam. Like, I just shot that across the room. Give me a second, I'll pick it up. So what I was saying is there's already some puckering here and that's actually expansion of the foam. So when I tighten this, that's what I look for for my telltale sign to know that I'm tight. I'm where I need to be, okay? So it's gonna exaggerate those puckers. This plane stand is just a touch too big as configured for this plane, which is fine. This assembly is so easy, it's like kind of nothing. Yeah, it's like, what are we missing? No, I, and I love, they've got ventral fins on here. That, that is so cool. cool. That looks so cool. They look like they might be backward though, but I don't know. I don't know the BAE. Um, Hawk, good enough to say that with certainty. certainty, certainty. Okay, so now that that glue is set up for a minute, I'm just gonna take one at a time and just touch them into it. And all that's gonna do is just hold those in place. Now you can obviously get those off of there, no problem, okay? And if they don't stay right away, what you can do is you can lift it and let it sit and cook off just a little bit longer, which is what I'm gonna do. Okay, so now while we're between steps, we need to set up the radio for our model profile. So let's go ahead and do that next. So this is gonna be kind of like our pseudo radio setup portion. Okay, so first things first, we're gonna press the back and cancel buttons, go into model select and add a new model. Okay, now the other way to do it, I'll just walk out, sorry. Click, click, scroll all the way down to system setup disconnect your RF, and then go to model select this way. Okay, now I'll look away for just a quick second, add new model, okay, you ready? Then we're gonna pick an acro and create. Now we go through this exhaustive setup every time because we want you guys to know how to do this. Note that it did take a few seconds for that to happen. 
Model type is what we just set. If you change that, it'll reset everything. Model name, this is where we put in the name. It's the 66th bird in here. So I'm gonna open and put the manual over here. So this is a BAE Hawk. So I have my legacy keyboard turned on and we'll come back when we're done typing. Okay, so we've got that set. So we'll just go back. Aircraft type, it's a normal wing and a normal tail because we got the stabilizer involved. And then I usually change the picture to something that's appropriate for that plane. I don't think we're gonna do flight modes. Did they tell us a timer? Mm -mm. Throttle cup first then, we'll set it to switch H. So when I move the stick, you see throttle's not moving in the monitor. And then when I turn off throttle cut, it starts working. Okay, so everything's good there. Then I wanna do timer. I'm gonna turn the one out on. That means anything over 25% is gonna start the timer and it's gonna keep running. If you turn that off, it just runs when you're over the threshold. So 25% being the threshold. Okay, so I want that active and five minutes is fine for now. I have no idea what type of telemetry we're gonna get. Probably not much of anything on that AR410. Do you wanna go back in the timer and set your warnings? Yes. Sorry, got ahead of myself. Next, next, one minute clear, nothing, 20 seconds, nothing, 10 seconds, I want voice. Expiration, I want tone and vibrate, and then tone every one minute. Thank you for catching that. Mm -hmm. All right, so as you can see, we start the throttle, it counts down, okay? Throttle cuts on, timer's cleared, walk over to monitor mode, now we can tell where our channels are, respective to what we need to plug in to our receiver, or vector stabilizer or flight flight controller. Okay, so we'll just leave this over here. We do have the CG ready to mark and we're done with this, but at this point, we're gonna go ahead and press these things down into the glue that's now had a chance to sit and cook. And as you can see, you put it down, it stays, and there's absolutely no apprehension about staying. This was just tucked in there to keep it out of the way. Now we know what channels we're on, so if you look down here with me, we've got throttle on channel one, so on the receiver, it's gonna ultimately be channel one, so this one's labeled as throttle. Okay, so throttle goes here, brown goes down. You can tell because it says minus plus S. It's molded into the plastic, okay? Not to be confused with the battery, it goes in port one, okay? Then port two is ailerons. So ailerons is gonna go here, channel two. Uh, then it's elevator, elevator is channel three. Brown is down. And then rudder is nothing, that doesn't exist. Then this becomes what would be our rudder. So our rudder is going to be configured as our modes. So channel four, let's show them. This channel, the rudder channel, we're gonna to wanna to disassociate that from the rudder and make that for our modes. So you can see we've got some extra cable here. And I think the easiest and safest way to deal with this is I'd really like to stick it up in there, but then I'm afraid I'm gonna hit those control rods. Mm. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna literally use the cable to wrap around itself like this. And then that's gonna make a nice, neat, finished product if we get it right. And then I'm gonna stuff it down in here and that can be loose. Okay, just like that. Pretty simple, nice, clean, basic install. Should be no problem at all. All right, so now, what we need to do is we need to make our vector assignments attached to rudder, okay? So we don't know what the settings are, it doesn't matter at this point, but what we're gonna do is we're just gonna make sure we disassociate this stick from rudder. This will no longer be a rudder control because this is a bank and yank, elevator, ailerons, and throttle. That's all that's gonna work, okay? So I think the easiest way is to go to system setup, disconnect RF, go down to channel assign, and rudder, looks like rudder is tied no matter what. Let's go to next, see how this says rudder. Elevator, I'm gonna just change that to, I don't know what port I want that to be because rudder is still gonna be rudder. Actually, I'm gonna inhibit rudder, okay? Then I can hit back, I can go back in and it's still not available, but that's okay. So basically to access that channel now, we need to make an assignment to one of these switches so that it actually changes things and we need to do dual rates in Expo. Okay, so I'm gonna click, scroll down to system setup, 
And then I'm gonna go to channel assign. Ooh, I don't know how that's exactly gonna work. Hmm, that is, that is a good question. So rudder is gonna be set to this channel. Hmm, I don't know, I haven't done that forever. And is that a three position? A three position? I want a three position, yeah. Because then we have stabilization on. Well, and to be honest, like the gear switch would be fine too. I did it on this mm -hmm. for the 540, but hmm. Let's do dual rates and expo real quick. Okay, I'm gonna set it to switch F. This will be my low setting at five. Sorry, can you still see? Mm -hmm. Then I'll do 10, then I'll do 20 and drop the rates down to like 90. Then I'm gonna go to elevator, set it to switch F. We'll do five, then 10. Whoa, geez. Then 20 and drop the rates down to like 90. And then rudder, put it to switch F. Oh, there is no rudder. There is no rudder. You know what? I'm just gonna set it anyway. I know it sounds stupid, but the reason I'm doing this is if I ever add a rudder, then I won't have to think about it. It'll just start to be set. <laughs> Creature of habit. Okay, <laughs> so walking out. So now I have to figure out how to control um, rudder because rudder is disassociated from the sticks. There's, no, there's nothing happening when I move that. And I don't want rudder to control that stabilizer so that when I move the stick like this, it actually does. Now there is another trick. Oh, okay, I don't know if this is gonna work, but I, I used to have to do this in my older transmitters. So if I go down to channel side, I'm gonna actually go to next. Watch this trick, guys. Rudder, okay, now watch this. Now I can go to mixing. This is a trick where you can go normal, rudder to rudder, rudder to rudder. Okay, the rate's gonna be 100. or actually minus 100 to minus 100, I believe, is what we do. And then basically what happens is your stick input is canceled out before anything happens on the output side of things. So now you see how the rudder's moving a little teeny bit. When I get this to minus 100, there'll be no movement. Okay, see, now it's not moving, but we're not inhibited either. Okay, and that's always on. We go to monitor mode. Looks like the rudder stick's broken, but it's not. Now, all I have to do is make a digital switch setup. I'm gonna move, auxiliary two is attached to this, but I don't care, it doesn't really matter. Switch B. Hmm. Okay, so let's walk out. Now let's go down to system setup, jump out of the, go to channel sign. And currently auxiliary two will inhibit that we'll inhibit that. We'll inhibit that because we have no access to it and then we'll inhibit that. And I'm just wondering if I can make rudder now controllable. Hmm, mixing. Okay, so just because I know how to do it this way, there might be another way to do it, guys. So I'm gonna make this rudder, or actually I'm gonna make it You can't use your switch to assign it. You have to actually scroll it in. So that's switch B, okay? And B is gonna be tied to rudder, okay? And at a rate of 100 to 100. See how it's moving? Cause I have my switch. Yay, okay, there we go. So 100 to 100, meaning it's gonna go both ways. You see how it's scrolling down as I do that? Okay, so neutral, there we go. Okay, yay. So now basically if this was a regular plane, you'd be going straight ahead, or excuse me, you'd be going straight ahead, then you'd be like, dear, dear. So it'd be like the worst control ever. Like the old read controlled systems from years past, look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. But basically now we have three position switch attached to rudder. But then if we look over in the menu, this doesn't make anything happen on rudder. This does, okay. So we now have vector control through a four channel receiver, yes. Now let's get the battery out and get this thing cooking. The battery is done charging. It's at 100%.
Looks like we're 4.2 and 4.19, so we should be golden here. And what we're gonna do is we'll use our little battery voltage alarm. We have to bind this, so throttle cuts on. Ordinarily, they'd suggest putting Velcro on this pack. I hate putting Velcro on packs. So we're gonna undo this Velcro here and we'll feed, I don't mind loops. Okay, so then this, does it slip? Um, doesn't feel like it's gonna slip. So you can, sometimes you can push that down, sometimes you can't. I have to try to slip it. Yep, it slips. Because it's not a very big battery. Sometimes you can put them vertical and that'll help too. So you can get them tightened down better. Uh, there is another trick to getting more pressure on a battery in a tight spot, and that is to use shelf liner like you put in your shelves. We actually just did that on the PT-17 over there, and that worked really good. I feel like that's probably tight enough for what we're doing. Okay, so we'll just plop that down. Voltage alarm, positive goes away from the negative. Okay, just let that go down there. And then we need to bind this. Now this might need to be level. I'm not 100% sure on the vector if it has to be level the first time or every time. I guess I honestly don't know because I haven't run into problems yet. But I'm gonna put it level, like the direction, the orientation, the attitude and everything that I want for flight. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my transmitter. The easiest way I know to get into bind mode is to basically hold this bind button down while binding. Okay, now that it's off, you can press down this button and then you can power it up. But we wanna get this ready to go. So we're gonna turn this on. I forgot I needed to bind my transmitter. So I'll have to pull this out again, but no big deal. We gotta press this once we turn on the power. So turning on the power meaning plug in the battery. So there's the battery. I'm gonna press this button once, let that start initiating. Then I'm gonna walk away just a little bit. I'm gonna press and hold this. Okay, now I can let go. Oh, shoot. I didn't hold it long enough. Okay, so I'm gonna do it again. Powering up while holding. Binding. Bind failed. If the bind fails, no big deal. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna click and scroll down to bind. It won't happen. Okay, I gotta walk over to the room a little bit further away. Got it. Okay, so now it's gonna set up. Okay, so now we test our control surfaces which are not hooked up. So we have roll left, roll right, elevator up, elevator down, who knows if that's working, and no rudder, which is what we want. So now when we change this setting, the rudder, okay, so we gotta check what direction's what, but first what we gotta do is get the control set up, which means I need to put this back down into its hiding spot, which worked really nice, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't really have any problems with that. I'm just tucking it in real tight so it kinda stays in there. Just kinda tucked it until it's stuck, okay? So now we can actually drop this down, we can check CG, and we can get those elevator controls plugged in. See how that wire's tucked down there nicely? Okay, so that's on there, they give us a nice pull here. Okay, so obviously we're in auto leveling mode here. And then we're in stabilization and nothing, okay? So I wanna flip that right now before I get ahead of myself. So the way to flip that is servo setup travel to reverse and rudder, there we go. So now I'm in auto leveling mode where I expect to be in auto leveling mode and then I'm in stabilization where I expect to be in stabilization. All right, so this plane is ready to fly with the exception of these control arms. We gotta get those landed and then we'll be golden. Okay, so our elevator is intact, okay? So you wanna make sure that these are true. Boy, that's really close already, awesome. It is close. So I'm gonna go to the, which hole do they recommend in the manual? I do not see. Do okay, I'm gonna just do the inside hole. That's gonna give us more output, okay? And then I'm gonna slide this little rubber out, but I'm gonna give it a little gap. You'll note that it didn't snap, now it's snapped. Okay, so when we move the elevator, it moves. 
We have to check the direction of travel there as well. I think it might be backward. And if it is backward, we need to fix that because that would be pretty devastating to your flight performance. Okay, so that's there. Ooh, that's really close. Maybe one more half turn. I'm using three fingers to hold the rod still. Half a turn more. Ooh, really close. Man, we got so lucky on this one. Mm -hmm. Like just how easy everything went. As we build a lot of planes here on Brian Phelps RC, for your viewing pleasure, and then even before we were doing this, um, we built a lot of planes. Okay, so that's backward and that's backward. Good thing we checked. All right, so now we can lay this down on its belly. Won't hurt anything. Elevator's backward. Rudder does nothing, which is what we want, and this is backwards. So I'm gonna go into servo setup, travel, reverse, either on, elevator. I don't know why I did that, that was an accident. So now we're gonna look, elevator up, elevator down, roll left, roll right. Now we're gonna try stabilization, up and down, roll left, right, and safe, or auto leveling. We're gonna go guys, we're gonna be flying this next. If you wanna help support the channel, buy this thing from the links below. If you don't wanna support us in that way, you can do Patreon or PayPal, or just come back and watch videos. We love having you in our audience, but we're losing sunlight. So stay tuned, so much more to come. Eros looks great, can't wait to fly this thing. I'm sure it's gonna be amazing. All right, YouTube, so you may notice it's slightly darker. Um, we ran into a couple of mishaps, and we rushed through our center of gravity marking. So we're just gonna talk about that again. Grab yourself your calipers, 65 to 75 millimeters back. Um, we'll just you know add this to the end of the unbox build radio setup. Typically we would show it, but we were trying to beat sunlight and we did ultimately beat it, but it was really bad and gravity beat us. We'll talk about that in a minute. So mark your, from your leading edge here, you'll just come back and you'll basically give yourself your mark. And it looks like it's, it's hard to tell exactly where the wing is. So if you kind of find the edge of the wing, you can sight it along, okay? And then I usually just take a Sharpie like this and I either pierce the hole with this sharp thing to kind of make my mark, or I'll take the Sharpie and I'll literally just make the mark with the Sharpie. And I know some of you guys are cringing thinking, Oh my goodness, I can't believe you would take a beautiful model and make a big black mark on the top. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it's not very pretty. And then the other measurement is 75 millimeters. So you just scroll out to 75, get it where you're comfortable. Okay. And just do the exact same thing or just look at the difference between the two and then you can mark from your first hole reference to your second hole. And uh, it works really easy in terms of testing, okay? So what I do is I take, and then I can feel that little bump. So I can feel it with the middle pad of my middle finger, my longest finger, and I get, that's on the first hole, which is closest to the nose of the plane. Then on the back hole, it's closest to the tail of the plane, and it's like falling off my finger, okay? So we're balanced at the very front of the range. So that means that really it'd be better if we could, you know, for a maiden, especially a hand launcher, you're not wheels up, wheels down, so you don't have any warning. You'd wanna get your battery forward. And you're like, wait, hold on a second. I thought you were using a 1300 2S. Well, we were. But then we realized that the manual calls out a 3S. So just a minor, minor issue. We didn't have enough power to fly. And when you hand launch a plane, you sort of commit yourself. And then when it doesn't go, it's quite hard to get it going, especially when the CGs may be a little bit aft, which is what I would normally like on a plane like this. You see that goes all the way forward, okay? There's a little, little stop right here. Now, this will barely fit in there, okay? But I just wanna show you, if you want it all the way forward, you have to adjust foam, okay? This is a 3S Gen 1 30C Smart Pack. Okay, so 3S, 1300, just like the Venom. The Venom in a 3S would be fine, almost exactly the same dimensionally, but it's just gonna be one extra cell. And then you can plop this right in there, do your thing. One other thing we noticed before I forget to mention it, we have a little rail along the side of this canopy, right where my middle finger is rubbing. 
that was hitting one of our two servo leads. So I had to just slip that over. So I just glued it on top of the other one, no problem. And then you'll note that it is allowed to close down tight, you see? Before it was lifted up just very slightly. It didn't cause any problems, but I'm sorry I didn't notice that. Um, okay, so now we gotta put this on to test CG. Test a plane like this upside down because there's all the weight of the stuff up here, okay? If you have retracts, you want the retracts to be deployed as though you're landing, generally speaking, okay? So now we're like nose heavy and way nose heavy, okay? Now the thing that's nice about a nose heavy plane, especially on takeoff, is that, excuse me, uh, the thing that's nice about the, the nose heavy planes on takeoff is that you're gonna be extra stable. So I push that back a little bit. On the front hole, now we're balanced out pretty good. Somewhere in the middle, it starts to go to tail heavy or to, to nose heavy, okay? Tail heavy means that it would, uh, it would fly, um, it, would, it would lean back like, this is the way it would look if it was tail heavy, okay? It would fall off your fingers. Tail heavy planes fly once, nose heavy planes fly stable. That's what a lot of people say. Well, they don't say that, but um, that's what I say. I have learned over the years that there are times when a, a, a little bit more tail heavy is good, and that is when you need to bring in a jet, particularly an EDF jet, and you need the flare to slow down. You can sometimes get a little bit of help from a little bit of tail heaviness. If your nose heavy, you're never gonna have enough elevator to, to lift up the nose while flying in a high, high attitude like this, okay? So what did we learn from our unsuccessful flight tonight? Which it's, it's bad enough, we're probably gonna put it at the very end. Don't try to fly on 2S, you don't have enough power for one thing. Unless you're slope soaring, and then you're gonna have to put a lot of counterweight up here. A battery this size would need to probably be all the way up here you know, like in this section. So you're not gonna have enough. You have to put some lead up there. Uh, lead weights, people get wheel weights. That's a good way of doing it. Um, you can use some coins if you have coins in your pocket. The thing that's nice about coins is you can stuff them into the foam. Now also, we did incur a little bit of damage when we uh, went on our 2S flight, which was about 30 seconds, well, not even 30 seconds, 15 seconds. We damaged his tail. And so we were in a big hurry trying to get back out there and film again and it just got so dark, we just couldn't do it. But I did fly it, and I did fly it successfully on this very pack, which is the 1300 3S from Spectrum. Nothing, nothing wrong with the Venom, it just happened to be that that was a 2S versus a 3S. And I had it in about here. Um, one thing that I did struggle with on hand launch is I forgot we have auto leveling in this mode. That would have been really nice. Also, I forgot that when you hand launch, this is a bank and yank plane, so you have no directional control on this stick, none. You just have throttle, okay? So this is where your elevator and your ailerons are. So I mixed the ailerons over here at least. Mm -hmm. So this mimics this. So over does the same thing as over, right? I wanna show you how to do that right now before I forget. Now the reason I do that is so I can hand launch and still have some roll authority. But the easiest thing to do would be to get into the auto leveling mode. Launch and then, you know, for your maiden especially, get it flying and then you can go out of that and get your trim set up. You know, we have quite a bit of trim here. Okay, if you have your control surface flat level on this, you're gonna probably have a heck of a time getting that thing to trim, okay? So you wanna go up just, just ever so slightly, okay? Same thing here, okay? You see that, that got broke, use the, just a, what did I use? Toothpick. A toothpick, and then I used two toothpicks, one right here and one right here. Again, I went outside and flew it five minutes later. So it was flying, but it was so dark we couldn't film, which sucks, because we really want to share these things with you. But anyway, this is the Unbox Build Radio setup. So this is gonna be right at the end of the video anyway. You've already seen it fly. Um, okay, so what you're gonna do is click, go down to mixing. I feel like I was right on mixing, there it is. Okay, and then we're gonna go down here. This is what we already made, rudder to rudder. That's what stops the rudder from doing anything. But as you hear, it's doing something. What is it doing? Well, it's not changing the rudder position because the rudder position is used for the vector, okay? Then we have uh, B to rudder, which is how we control this part. Okay, that's how we control the vector. 
Then we have rudder to aileron. So it's rudder to aileron at 100% to 100%. So instead of controlling itself, it's controlling this. And that doesn't screw up nope. the vector thing. Nope. Oh, cool. It's the same exact way. It doesn't know any better. See, all the way over, right. all the way over, all the way over, all the way over, all the way over. You can overdrive your servos. In certain conditions, you need to be careful about overdriving your servos. And thirdly, while we're talking about roll, hopefully this thing doesn't oscillate when flying because I went to the inside hole. Show them on that one. We went to the inside hole. We basically slid this back. We popped this off with our fingernail, just like this. And then we screwed in or screwed out to get this to give us proper alignment to give us proper alignment. And we went down to the bottom hole instead of the top hole. Okay. It was on the top hole, the top hole by default. So now we have more aileron roll authority. Okay. Now you'll also note that we went to the inside hole on the elevators. That was fine. I had no problems with that. In fact, I'd like a little bit more. Now, when we get this thing flying good, we got appropriate power, all that, all that stuff is worked out. You know what we're gonna do to get more elevator authority? What are we gonna do, camera crew? Change the position, oh, battery back. We're gonna move it back, which is gonna make the plane a little bit more tail heavy and a little bit less nose heavy, i.e. balanced. Once it's balanced, then this pivot inducer will work better, okay? Because remember, when we pivot a plane, you're pivoting it on the center of gravity, okay? So if your center of gravity is up here, you got to pivot tons more. If your center of gravity is back here, you got to, you know, same thing. So if you're balanced, then your elevator is more capable in doing its job appropriately. And those are all design features that can be adjusted. Um, on our second failed attempt, we ran into a gutter, so I used some paper. Paper, uh, these are like label. Like mailing labels. Mailing labels to cover up two gouges because I ran into our gutter and it goes <laughs> cut like that. So anyway, we always try to show you this stuff. We don't always show all the repairs, but the idea is that thing looks pretty sweet in my opinion. Yep. The only issue is I've got some tape here, which I don't like seeing tape, but you know, whatever. I don't, it's not the end of the world. Um, you can avoid doing that by having the correct cell. And also I'm just gonna tell you to swallow your pride, put it in auto leveling, get it flying because auto leveling through the vector has been really good. Um, I'm super surprised when we first started working with uh, Eros, we did this edge and I said, there's no way that that thing is going to fly very good because 3D planes are historically pretty challenging. You could fly good in my opinion. So turned out it was wrong, which is great. I love being wrong when it's like that. So that thing flew great. And I, I flew today off camera with that new prop too, did great. So the other thing is over here, we were gonna just point out where it talks about the three S. If you look at this, yeah. Yeah, so it's right there, 11.1 11 point, 11 .1 is three S, this is 7.4. Okay, so no big deal, no harm, no foul. Uh, except for the fact that we didn't get to fly tonight and that breaks my heart because when we do flights, it's always a bummer when you have something like that happen. Here's the key is that we're telling you now, we're also gonna mention it in the flight at the beginning specifically so that you know, don't use a 2S because we're gonna talk like you're supposed to use a 2S for just a brief couple of seconds in the video because that's what we thought we were supposed to use. Our apologies to you, uh, viewer. If you're A by C, A, A, B, C, A by C. So this plane is super cool. I wish you could have seen it fly. It flies really good. It is most definitely a bank and yank. There is no yaw authority. There's no steerable nose gear that can have a clear thing on it. But at the same time, I also used a four channel trans or receiver rather to get all the controls and vector on off uh, or stabilizer on off off and then of course the auto leveling. But there's no reason why you couldn't throw in a rudder on this plane if you'd like, but then you'll have to jump up to the AR620 or the one next to it, which would be the AR630. And the 630 is an antenna-less breed too. 
You could use the 631 if you prefer to have an antenna, but this is a park flyer. It's very small, so you, you know, you're not gonna get so far away from yourself that you can't see it or get your orientation. Also, I was flying in dark, mm -hmm. and I could see this pretty good, but the red color up against pink clouds and purple clouds, which is what I was seeing, it was really pretty, but it was, you couldn't pick it up on camera, uh, made it quite easy to see. And I was afraid that this flat red color would be hard to see. I felt like it was actually pretty easy to see. What I might do is I might actually put some racing stripes or invasion stripes on here just so that I can see the bottom a little bit better than the top and just to differentiate. Not sure if I'm gonna do that right now or later. Um, but guys, in general, I always love a good hand toss plane, something that you can just go out and have fun with and you don't have to worry about a bunch of complicated retracts and flaps and LEDs and things like this that just make everything heavier. This thing is extremely light, but just to show you, because we know you're going to ask the question, we're gonna weigh it now, because then you'll know if you have to follow the drone registry rules. It's the moment of truth. So we're gonna turn it on with our high-tech digital scale from Taylor. No, they didn't send it to us. And as you'll see, this is about 500 grams. So again, stupidest rule in the history of rules but it is still nonetheless. 250 grams is the limit. All up weight on this is just under 500 as we flew it. So that means you have to, of course, have your sticker on the outside and all that. And we never talk about that stuff here, but you do. Um, love the lines on it, love the way it looks. Once you get it in the air, flies great. But generally speaking, when you fly an EDF with too little power, it's gonna fly pretty bad. So without further ado, at the end of this video, as we always promise to do, we're gonna show you full disclosure. Did we even get the clip of the crash? Uh, the 2S? Yeah, I think so. Okay, if we have it, we'll put it at the very end so you can just watch what happens when you try to launch a 2S plane um, that's supposed to be 3S. Now that being said, I love the way this flies. I hope our remaiden tomorrow. I hope Mother Nature agrees. And then secondarily, I hope that it flies as good as it flew tonight because it was pretty dang good. And by the way, greasy, beautiful landing. Of course, it was on the grass, so not really much to say. And to be honest, look how nice this thing looks. Guys, that's been crashed hard three times. And you're like, I thought you ran into the gutter when you try to launch on 2S. No, I tried it twice. And you know, because I'm hard headed. <laughs> so the second time was terrible. And then my camera crew reluctantly, she, she very uh, wisely talked me into looking at the manual. That's why you watch Brian Phillips RC, so that Megan can keep you from crashing your planes. <laughs> All right, stay tuned guys. We'll show you that clip next. If you wanna help support the channel, buy the plane from the link below. We'll link to the AR410 which is a receiver we used. Obviously the vector is built into the plane, so you get that with the plane. Um, and then also we'll link to the battery that we use in this case, 1300 3S Smart Pack. That's a Gen 1 so that we can use a voltage alarm. As you can see here, we just got a simple voltage alarm. And then of course we used the NX8, which has been working fantastic. If you have questions, let us know in the comments below. We're really liking the Aero stuff. Um, obviously good quality products, went together super easy. I mean, this is probably about a half an hour build for the average person, maybe a little bit less if you're um, faster than we are, but um, up in the air, ready to fly in less than a half an hour. You can probably charge the battery and be flying about the same time. So without further ado, stay tuned. YouTube, it's Brian Phillips, look at this. We've got the BAE Hawk, really, really cool. Look at the lines on that thing. So sweet. It's just a little 50 millimeter EDF bank and yanker. This thing is, believe it or not, flying on 2S 1300. We got a Venom in here. 2S. Little Venom. Excuse vector. me. Vector. vector stabilizer. Vector stabilizer. And we ran it on a an AR-410, which is uh, tucked in underneath. So without further ado, we're gonna try to get this flight before it gets dark. I'm gonna actually launch it like this. We'll see how it goes, throttle cuts off. You know what? They got launch hands here, so I'm gonna just try it that way first. Ugh. Okay, so we did not have enough power, not even close. 
Not even close, guys. Okay, so I'm beginning to think that 2S was an accident. Let's pause and come right back. 